Hey, good morning and welcome back everyone. Uh, my name is Jason Harris. I'm your MC for today. Uh, we are going to kick off our next panel right now. It's an executive fireside chat. It is uh, chaired by George Fraser, our co-founder and CEO. George, take it away. Thanks very much, Jason. And I am very excited to have an all-star panel with us today. Uh, this, I think, is going to be a great discussion. Uh, you all can come back on video and uh, off mute. Uh, we, uh, we have a great panel. I'll just give a very brief introduction for everyone. Um, so we have Michelle Offord with us. Uh, Michelle is the co-founder and CEO of Notable, which is bringing notebooks to the masses. Uh, notebooks the way of, uh, are a way that I think you all know of, of working with uh, data in a different kind of UI format. Um, before that, she was a key member of the big data team at Netflix, which really pioneered doing analytics in the public cloud. Um, we have Tristan Handy, who you just heard from, who is the co-founder and CEO of Fishtown Analytics. Uh, the primary sponsor of DBT. Um, and you may not know that back in the day, Tristan was a Stitch Data guy. So we used to be competitors. And, <laughs> but now we're best pals, uh, helping to bring the modern data stack to everybody. Um, we have uh, Mar Martine from Andreessen Horowitz, um, who is a uh, Fivetrans uh, Series B investor and a fantastic board member. And uh, before that, he was a, a, a founder, and he was a tech guy, and then he kind of turned into a little bit of a sales guy, um, and uh, now he helps us grow Fivetrain into what it is meant to be. And we have Bob Buglia, uh, who has been a friend for years. Uh, he uh, is currently investing and serving on boards of a variety of interesting companies, including Fivetrain. Um, before that, uh, he's had a very storied career. Uh, most recently, he was CEO of Snowflake during the critical years when they went from a tiny stealth company to the world be beating enterprise that we know today. And another fun fact, uh, Bob and Martine were competitors back in the day when Martine was at Nicera and VMware and Bob was at Juniper. So this is just kind of how technology works. You know, don't be too mean to your competitors because later they're going to be your friends. <laughs> um, all right. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and kick this off with uh, a, a spicy topic, I think, at least spicy in this crowd, which is data lakes. Um, so data lakes is a, is a blurry term. Uh, it's used by different people to mean different things sometimes. But for the purposes of this discussion, let's define data lakes as tabular data, so tables, rows and columns, stored in an open source file format uh, like Parquet or Orc in a public cloud object storage like S3 or Google Cloud storage. And then, you know, maybe we can add on as an asterisk like images and things like that, but that's kind of like a, that's, that's, a, that's sort of a part two of data lakes. And what I'd love to get is a, is a quick one or two minutes from each of you on the, on the primary question and then um, we can jump into discussion. So the primary question is uh, in a world where we have data warehouses, that uh, use object storage to store their data and, and give you some of the advantages of data lakes, do data lakes still have a place? Uh, and let's start with you, Michelle, because Netflix was really the pioneer. You were there when they were created of data lakes in the public cloud. So do they have a place and why? Yeah, I wasn't there when they created it, but um, certainly benefited from it. And you know, I think we're going to see the data lake really start to go away and see more and more things put into um, technologies like Snowflake. I think it really uh, eliminates the need that we had back when we were first creating those data lakes. And I think that you'll see that it's going to be a, a long tail here because it's not an easy challenge. And in order to do it well and really get rid of the, the data lake, you really need to have the technology in place, but you also need to have the teams in place. And this is where I think you, you'll start to see a shift towards like decentralization of your data teams, 
um, or data mesh is um, another way uh, it's called. And so you'll see that there will be greater teams that have, uh, or more teams that are embedded across the business that have greater ownership. And, and that's going to really eliminate a lot of the need that we had traditionally for the data lake. We've also started to see all of the pain that it creates. Um, and so that is another uh, a challenge for us that I think that we're gonna see get better as, as things continue to move forward and move towards more of like a, a well-organized, well-understood world. Wow, I thought I thought you were going to be more of the defender. We're going to need somebody. Uh, I, you know, I do Martine. think the, the data lake will have a place. I don't think it's going to go away. I just think it's not going to look like how it looks today. Um, I think today it's just been a, a lack of understanding around you know what really needs to go into the data warehouse. What data do we really need to collect? Right now, I think we're collecting a lot of data that we probably should not be collecting. I say we not in terms of Netflix, but more generally. You know, we went to this, uh, we went from one extreme to the other. We weren't collecting any data, now we're collecting everything because we don't know what's valuable. And the reality is that's not necessarily a good idea either. And so, um, you know, starting to really trim out those data sets, I think is gonna be part of it. Um, but then, you know, your images, your, your blob storage, all of those things I think are probably going to remain in the data lake and, and have a, a home there for a long time to come. Okay. Uh, well, Martine, I'd love to get you next on this question. Does the data lake have a future? Yes. <laughs> so I, I think I think one of the um, I think one of the biggest fallacies that we do as an industry is we look at an architecture and we're like, oh, that can do all of these things. Therefore, it will be pushed into service to do all of these things, right? And by that logic, by inductive closure, the compiler companies will be every software company, and that's just not how technology evolves. In the end of the day, I think that we make decisions in the design space based on the primary use cases that technology is being used for. I mean, these are enormous, enormous design spaces, right? And if you look at kind of, you know, we just did this huge survey, actually. If you look at the use cases that data warehouses are being used for, they're largely driven by analytics, which is a certain workflow. It's a certain um, query pattern. Um, and if you look at where data lakes, it's actually quite different. They tend to be more unstructured data, focused on operational AI, compute intensive. And so if you look at the respective technologies, they're just being optimized in this massive design space for different use cases. And so in my experiences, you end up with pluralities of technologies where architecturally, sure, they can both do what the other one does. But in the end, you've got products and companies optimized around use cases. And I think the operational AI use case is a larger one, and it's growing faster. So actually, I think over time, you could argue that the, it's the data lake that ends up consuming everything, not the, uh, the data warehouse. That's just, you're just trying to provoke Bob <laughs> Martin. <Come> on. <laughs> I've <just> succeeded. <laughs> I'm watching Bob's face. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Bob, let's, let's hear from you. Well, data I think lake that, does it have a future? Uh, no, but it's a long term. That's a long term perspective. It's an arc of time, and you have to look at, at at the evolution of how infrastructure changes over time to take on new capabilities. I actually don't. You know, I mean, uh, what Michelle said made total sense to me, and largely, Martine and I are not actually that far out of sync, in the sense that I see these things very largely converging onto a relational SQL based model, and I think that 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 five years from now data is going to sit behind a SQL prompt by and large, or, and then over time evolve into relational, everything relational. Um, uh, so that's, that's, that's my perspective that, that, you know, that relational will, will dominate and, and data warehouse, SQL data warehouses will replace data lakes. Now, I think today, in today's world, from the perspective of storing structured and semi-structured data, the cloud SQL data warehouses already do everything that is necessary. And there really is no reason for people to have a separate data lake there, except for historical precedent. And that's important. I mean, a lot of companies come from uh, environments where they had a lot of semi-structured data that they used in a Hadoop environment. And having a data lake is a natural transition to that. And in a sense, the, the data lake, which is really store S3 storage together with a wide variety of any tools you want to put on top of it, is a, is a very generalized platform. You can do anything with that. But over time, infrastructure evolves to take on more and more of the use cases. SQL relational data warehouses have evolved to the point that for structured and semi-structured data, storage and query, they subsume all of what needs to be done pretty much today. And I think, I think we're seeing almost every tool work with products like Snowflake. So the issue of tools being compatible, that, that's gonna go away very quickly. What remains is, is images, 
video, documents, PDFs, that all remains. And that data source is becoming more and more important. Now, I don't call that unstructured data. I think that's a misnomer. There's no such thing as unstructured data. All data has structure of some kind. Structured data is tables, rows and columns. Semi-structured data is, is like JSON, it's hierarchical in its nature. And I think there's a third category of data which ultimately will become of great importance to business, which is what I call complex data. Images, documents, videos, anything, most things that are streaming fall into this category with the exception of just pure log files and semi-structured, but any kind of, 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 of source from a modern thing such as a video camera. And more and more what's happening is machine learning can be applied to the contents of those data sources that turn it into typically semi-structured data that can be used for building you know, complex data applications and for doing predictive analytics. So what's missing in the, in the case of the data warehouse today is the support for complex data, but that's gonna come, that's called a feature. It's always been a feature that was in the plans for, for what we were doing at Snowflake. And you'll see that coming over time. Uh, so, I, you know, from Snowflake and I think from others too, everybody will do this because it just makes sense to build the infrastructure. Can you imagine if you could transact, fully transact all of these, these types of images, videos and things together with any source of data in a, in a, in a, a semi-structured data in a data warehouse? The applications that open up are remarkable and that's gonna come in the next two to three years. And that'll ultimately put the nail in the coffin of the data lake. Can I just ask a clarifying point? Do you, do you think that image data, like I could see images being easily retrieved from the database, but do you actually see all of the image processing or the video processing taking place in the database as well? Not with SQL, SQL can't do that. So you'll use procedural logic in Python or something else to do that at least for now. In the long run, relational will win too, but that's probably more like eight to 10 years away. I think we've been waiting for that for 40 years, Bob. Yeah. Wait, wait, wait. We still no, but we have, but look what's happened. Look what's happened. OLAP got transferred. Got, if you look kind of over time, <laughs> navigational and hierarchical in the 1980s got replaced with SQL. OLAP got replaced with SQL over the last 10 or 10 years or so. We're now hitting the point, and we, we replaced, for sure, we've replaced MapReduce with relational. So all of these things, relational always wins. It's just a matter of time. Well, relational Kristen. wins for the actual retrieval, right? But what about the, the processing? I mean, the technology that you need to process images is fundamentally different than you do to retrieve data. Right? It's not there so, yet. It's not can we, there yet. Can we Sorry. jump out of like the pure technology for a second and talk about uh, like market forces and community versus closed right. source and all of this stuff? So uh, we, I have the strong belief that, you know, when you talk about different BI tools, different like analysis layer uh, BI tools. There's no like correct user interface for analyzing data. There are different ways that one might want to go through, maybe because you have different use cases that you're trying to analyze, or uh, maybe because like your brain as a human like maps to the way one tool works. And I think of this, this question in a very similar way. So like, uh, there, uh, I completely agree that like uh, SQL is uh, going to dominate data processing, uh, at least a very large chunk of data processing. Um, but there's like different APIs that the data lake and the data warehouse expose. So like there's the file storage layer. And for a lot of re reasons, I believe that an organization will store their files one time. Um, you will not have a data warehouse copy of the file and the data lake copy of the file, which in some architectures today, that's what you see. Um, and so that requires you to have a, an open source file format that is shared between your data warehouse use cases and your, your other use cases. Um, I think that like above that, you have like indexing and metadata that like is a core part of the, the data warehouse, but it's also a core part of the data lake. I think those have to also start to converge so that different use cases can take advantage of the same stuff. Um, and then you have like the SQL prompt and maybe like at the SQL prompt layer, like maybe the data warehouse dominates, but I think you need to allow different access patterns as well. Cause one, one closed source firm is never gonna accomplish literally all data processing use cases in the world. Of course, of course. 
and, and in fact, you need to be able to work with a wide variety of different tools to be able to work with all of this data. And it should be available. All of these things should interoperate in an open source and an open format way. But the issues of format have kind of gone away because you can input, import, input and output any kind of format and export into any kind of format very easily. You know, the question of whether you have one copy or two, having two is not necessary for any reason uh, except potentially for backup. And I can always see people wanting to have a backup of things separate from what they're doing and having, you know, putting that in some kind of archival storage. The question is, what are the operations that actually need to be performed against data that sits in a data lake? And today, anything associated with complex data, the data warehouse can't help you. And so there's a huge reason to have a data lake today. In 2025, I don't think so. I don't think so. It's a matter of time. And I think Databricks, by the way, I also think, and this is, this is you know, an interesting conversation as well, I think that both Snowflake and Databricks, while they will come from very different places, Snowflake will always be SQL and declarative in its approach. And Databricks certainly historically has been procedural um, uh, uh, and, and code based. So it's a version of SQL versus code in some senses. And I think you'll see both companies and pretty much everybody else in the industry offering both within their platforms. We really have five platforms being created, you know, globally: Snowflake, Databricks, and then the three clouds. Um, Bob, and I think, I think I think they're all building the same thing in the end. I actually think they'll all build yeah, exactly. The same thing. So, so Bob, I mean, <laughs> an interesting question is: okay, so let's say you've got two technologies that start with different use cases, somewhat different architectures, but they're clearly going into a converged point, which is you have some declarative something and you have some procedural something, and like whether one's on top or the other, like at the end of the day, they can both do both. But in the meantime, you have this decade long journey. And in that decade long journey, there's an entire ecosystem built around use case. There's an architecture that's optimized around use cases. I mean, the number of knobs in any RDBMS is just unbelievable, right? As far as optimization and this. And this. What are you talking about? Snowflake has no knobs. <laughs> I mean, no, there are, the journey, look, the, the investments are very true, though. No, the no, 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 sorry, the develop, no, from the developer standpoint, the, 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 the amount of trade-offs and decisions you make when building one of these systems is- Yeah, like Timescale DB yeah. has very different characteristics than Snowflake, and they are and, characteristics does, that are optimized for a workflow. Does, yeah, as the, I mean, like, all, like, these are all, like, like entire companies focusing on different <laughs> points in the design space with different optimization parameters. And so a decade of this, it almost is, um, it tends to have been the case in the industry that it's actually the use case that drives the technology because of all of the gravity around it. And so again, if it turns out that AI ML and kind of an operational use is the one that's growing quicker, which it seems to be certainly from an investor standpoint, it seems that's more gonna dictate the technology then if you kind of look at either of them, you say, well, it can actually consume this as well from an architectural standpoint, which is the um, easier can, actually, to, you know. Martin, can I ask you a follow-up question? George, am I allowed to ask questions as yeah, well as answer them? absolutely. Um, <laughs> Martin, you've said a couple of times now that the AI ML space is appearing to grow faster. I don't know what, I, I've actually not heard that assertion before. I'm curious let, if you can let, say let anymore. Me, let me, let me <laughs> clarify. And it's off, and it's off a very low base. So let, let me let me let me just qualify this. So, so broadly, two use cases, right? There's the analytics use case, which you're all very familiar with, um, which is driven by queries and dashboarding. The other one is is you know creating a complex model from a data scientist and then serving that in production, right? And what does that do? That does things like wait time prediction. That does things like fraud detection. That does things like dynamic pricing. Um, these are, you know, the, the prior to the being consumed by data, like these were kind of folks in R building like complex models on existing data and then coming up with a bespoke way of serving that. That is very clearly now turning into a pattern that's being served by a data lake. Now, it, it's on a much smaller base, but if you actually look in the industry, this is growing far faster because it's less mature off a small base. Now, you could make the argument it's going to asymptote and they're going to end up the same place or whatever, but it's a, it's a very rapidly growing use case. Michelle, you've spent time in both the uh, data science community and the analytics community. And in the position you're in now, uh, notebooks in many ways are the place where these things sometimes come together. I'm curious to hear your thoughts about how the, the two stacks have evolved and, and maybe they're converging, maybe they're building each other's features and getting more similar, but where does that take us? Do we still have two stacks uh, five years hence or do they, do they truly converge and it just becomes a, a giant 
final battle at the end of the movie. <laughs> well, I think, um, you know, I think we're going to continue to see greater and greater um, specialization because of the speed with which we want to do things and the fact that we need to appeal to um, less technical users or people who might not have been classically trained as data scientists, maybe your citizen data scientist, just by, by sheer demand, right? We're not going to have uh, the ability or the budget to hire enough data scientists. And so you're going to see like there, those stacks are going to continue to evolve and it's going to be specialized based upon what it is that they're trying to do. Because um, uh, data science is such an overloaded term anymore. Um, and then you also have, uh, you know, everybody else, right? Your analytics team. And, and as, we, as I mentioned, like, I think you're going to see decentralization here. Uh, I think there's some interesting points. I, I do think things like, you know, the the movement of data, or I, I think we're going to see that stop. But I think, um, you know, format is going to be really important. We need that interop because reprocessing data at scale is just it's it's cost prohibitive. It's time prohibitive. Um, you know, it, it's not something that we want to do if we can avoid it. And so, what you're going to do is see that at the lower levels, where you've got either either like the business use, units embedded, or you've got like your your um, new product teams, um, you've got your data science teams embedded in those product teams, you're gonna need a unifying layer at the very top, right? And, and bringing these things together. And so that could be in the form of, um, you know, technologies that make it easier for everybody to query or be able to serve um, information. Uh, in my opinion, I think that the notebook is probably the best suited for that because it does have the, the language agnostic approach. It gives you the ability to look at both um, data and, and code and have all of that context, that rich business context. Um, the visualizations, it's basically everything you need to work with data. And so we're going to see that, in my opinion, evolve as like this modern data document. And we can use that as part of our unifying layer because your data scientists can then work with R, your, your data analysts can work with SQL, but we can, at the end of the day, really kind of hide all of the code and really get to like the meat of what it is that we're trying to discuss, which is what is the business implication of these things that we're doing. So this really... Um, brings us to the second major topic that I wanted to discuss, which is how do we bring these machine learning and the, the machine learning Python Scala world, our world, and the uh, analytics SQL BI tool world together. Uh, we've talked about it from a bunch of different angles. There really are two stacks and two communities. We see this at Fivetran. We have customers who sync the exact same data sources to uh, Delta Lake and to Snowflake simply for operational reasons. Uh, there's not really a, there's not a fundamental technological reason, but it's just the way the tooling has evolved. It's too inconvenient to cross that boundary. And um, there's essentially two visions of, uh, well, maybe three visions of that world. One is um, that you're gonna put machine learning into SQL and probably BigQuery is the furthest along in pursuing this. You basically create a bunch of UDFs that um, do your linear algebra stuff. Uh, the other is more the Databricks vision, uh, where you put SQL into Python <laughs> or, or SQL into Scala, and you use data frames to do that. And then, then there's maybe a, a third vision where you use uh, Arrow, where everyone implements Arrow, the uh, network, uh, the, the interchange format, and everything can just talk to each other, and you can, you can arrange it any way you want. I, which of these visions do you think is going to win? And which of these visions would you like to win? <laughs> uh, sometimes those are different answers. And I'll ask everyone, let's start, start again with you, Michelle. Well, I don't know which one's going to win. Um, but I know what I would like to see win is, is something like Arrow, right? So that you have the interop. Uh, I imagine that you know, you're going to see both things happen. You're going to see machine learning moving into SQL because you're going to have data engineers who are perfectly capable and have the need to do some anomaly detection or some logistic regression. And they're, it's within their ability to do that, right? Future engineering is just another data transformation for them. Um, but they don't have the same background in stats and, and so they can only take it so far. And then you're gonna see on the other side of the spectrum, your data scientist where they have all of like this really great math background um, and they understand, uh, you know, how to do more advanced, uh, you know, maybe deep learning but they don't have the, the technology skills and SQL is the most successful language for working with data. Um, and so I think that you're going to really see kind of both of them uh, really become um, you know, capable of supporting both use cases. But ultimately at the, at the end of the day, uh, you'll continue to see specialization here where you know, the things that you wanna do if you're trying to do deep learning are just fundamentally different than the types of things if you're trying to do like predictive models. Tristan, what, do you, yeah. what, do you, what, are, your, what are your thoughts on this? I, I think a lot about the arrow version of the world and, and I 
I think that that will end up in the fullness of time dominating. Um, I think that there are, uh, and it's for, for the same reason that Martine has been talking about that like tools end up evolving to the personas that they serve and the use cases that they serve. Um, I think though that like the thing that is not true today that I really like desperately want to be true. So I, I think about the, this problem a lot from a DBT perspective. Uh, I want DBT to like do all the data prep and then, and, and like, you know, that's called feature engineering in another world. And uh, then I want machine learning models to be trained on top of that. And there are, uh, people do that. Certainly people do that. But the, uh, but the fact that the infrastructures to do those two different things are generally separate creates this big uh, slowness. Uh, and it's, not, it's, it's purely like a technical slowness. Um, and error doesn't solve all of that. Uh, error certainly helps, but like, there's like dumb things like the servers that do those things are in different clouds and the like uh, uh, interchange fee, what do you, do you call them interchange fees? The, the uh, ex, ex, egress, 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 yeah. egress fees uh, are expensive. It's like really dumb things like that. They're, that, they're criminal like, as this, and they're not just <laughs> expensive, they're ridiculous. <laughs> right. Sorry. So like, as, this, as more people do this, it's going to become smoother. Like they're, they're going to become more localized. Martine, what say you? Which which vision of the future wins? Which do you want to win? Yeah, so I mean, listen, I don't actually have much to add at this point. Like, I also believe in the uh, in the the arrow future, and it's exactly for the reason that Tristan said, which is, at the end of the day, you know, there's a reason why you've got multiple languages, and it's not because like one is turning complete and the other isn't. And the reason is is because people build their entire workflow around languages and all of the tools and like whatever their vimrc file can like have like special like hooks in. Uh, and so you're gonna have a heterogeneous fragmented um system and it's always thus been the way in in uh in in computer science um and it will be so therefore you do need to have open interfaces bob well i guess in some ways my mission in life has been to build integrated so you know infrastructure to make this easy for people. And that's what I've always done in my whole life. And certainly that was the approach that we took at Snowflake. And I think that the team's still taking, I'm a big believer uh, at this time in the approach of, of having multiple systems that interact with common, with common formats. Arrow is a huge step forward for that. Uh, not just because it's an efficient format, but because it provides a consistent in-memory layout uh, for people to do advanced analytics you know, in their Spark environments. And so I think it's a huge step in that direction. It allow, and it's the way the world is working right now because most customers actually have a data warehouse and an analytics platform separately and they are connecting them together and, 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 and facilities like Arrow really make that easier. Now I'm the radical, however, I'm gonna continue to be the ultimate radical and declare that this is a huge and important step in the evolution of data. But the way I kind of look at it, like I say, relational always wins. And, and to me, the approach that we're taking today in terms of machine learning is still roughly the approach of the internal combustion engine in the automobile. And the, and, and the approach that's happening where Arrow ties together those predictive systems together with, with declarative databases, that's really the creation of the hybrid or the pre, sort of the Prius era. And I think we're, we're, approaching, we're, we're, we're approaching that kind of era where we have a hybrid architecture and hybrid will dominate for the next say three to five years. And you will see hybrid systems being built by every major vendor. Um, and so all of them will have a full predictive stack and a full declarative relational SQL stack built in using a, some kind of interface like that. I think that's the way the world will go for a while, but that's only until relational actually solves the broader set of problem, <clears throat> which is coming, which will come. Uh, the, I believe that all of the predictive analytics, or certainly many, maybe not all, but many of the pro predictive analytics solutions that are being done today using standard techniques will ultimately be done with relational technology, but that's probably five years away. Does that mean that you'll be using SQL functions, predict no. X? No. Or, no, no, ironically, ironically, I think, you know, ironically, I think that, that while SQL will dominate and into the future, well into the 2030s for the way of doing data modeling and data transformation. And it is the future for that for the next decade. There's another step beyond that, which is business modeling. And that needs to be represented in a knowledge graph. And, and knowledge graphs are how we'll do predictive analytics in the 2030s. I will pretty much guarantee that from my perspective. 
and and uh, and what needs to happen is a whole new generation of data system that's based on relational knowledge graphs to create that. Um, but we're not there yet. The technology's not there yet. But it's coming. It'll come. Very cool. Well, um, Michelle, you brought up one of uh, a term earlier uh, that I wanted to follow up on, which is uh, data mesh. Uh, and uh, I wonder if you could define that briefly for everyone, because I think um, similar to data lakes versus data warehouses, there's a question there about, you know, how that came about and, and whether going forward, that's more of a historical phenomenon or, or an actual architect, a, a good architecture that we want to continue. Sure. Um, you know, I, I, I'll take a stab at defining it, but the data mesh is really a, a concept of decentralizing the data, um, the data processing and the ETL and the analytics into the, each individual business unit and then having some sort of unifying solution at the top. Um, and, and to do this well it requires like a lot of components. It requires like having specialized data teams, having special specialized roles, having infrastructure um, as a service available to them for data processing. Um, and then having some sort of like overarching like standards board, right? Or, or some group, um, almost like a federation of, of your, we'll say like your data, data engineers to ensure that all of your ETL looks consistent so that as you are trying to do data retrieval and some sort of common, um, you know, a query tool such as maybe Snowflake, then you'll, um, you know, you'll, you'll have that familiarity that you need. I think that there's challenges with it. And I think we're a long way from, from doing it. And, and now that I think about it, you know, I think uh, we are going to see things like Arrow really come to the forefront uh, sooner rather than later. I think customers are going to demand it because of all of the challenges that we're currently having. Um, again, when you're looking at, at scale, you've got all the cost of the storage and the processing, you've got all of the challenges with your, um, with your various, uh, you know, um, basically all of your teams that are trying to do the processing don't have the business context that they need. And so as a result, you have this back and forth, a lot of like wasted time, you've got a lot of data quality errors when you're gonna data multiple times. And so ultimately we really wanna take like that body of knowledge and, and, and put the technology where that body of knowledge lives. And so the, the data mesh is, is an attempt to, to do that. Does anybody, uh, have a better definition. I mean, what I would, I think your definition is good. I think your definition is good. The only thing I, the thing I would add about the data mesh is I really kind of separate it into two things. One part of what the data mesh folks are talking about is how to organize and how to structure a team to manage data across a large enterprise with very disparate and important data sources. And, and the idea of how you structure teams to manage data and build teams around it, there's some good ideas that are coming out of data me the data mesh folk. And certainly that those are areas where those are organizational dynamics issues and need, you know, there's there's a lot of of, of people interaction issues that, that are very critical in, in that. And that's very, very important. And there's some good ideas in data mesh for that. Architecturally, data mesh has this sort of odd idea that you can use uh, you can use stream, take stream, you, the data is basically streaming. And you can use facilities like Kafka to do transforms and you can pretty much do all of the work you want to do as the data is in flight. And I don't believe that. I, I think that that is, is totally missing the fact that while there is streaming data and you can do quite a bit with data that's simply streaming, in other words, append only data. To me, another critical source of data is transactional data coming out of business systems. And those are transactional. And the streaming-based solutions have no answer for that. And they just sort of pretend that consistency, data consistency is unimportant. And I don't understand that because I put data consistency at the top of the issues that I think about when I think about managing data. Yeah, I, you know, mesh has historically been one of these terms that conflates architecture with administrative domains. And it did this in service mesh and it did this in Wi-Fi meshes and mesh networking, et cetera. I think Bob's actually, Bob is exactly right, which is there is a very real issue with kind of separate administration domains, um, separate processing domains, separate access to tool sets. That's very, very different than building a fully distributed architecture, which just tends to be hard and inefficient. And I think that so often, and it's, uh, it's often not the people that promote kind of the mesh idea, but when people hear the term mesh, they default to full distribution, which tends to be just a bad way to build systems. Um, Said like a networking guy. <laughs> well, he is. Let's be <laughs> Having seen this exact same thing happen in other domains for a couple of decades. 
I, we're, I think all of us are very uh, technology focused human beings. And uh, so when we think about data mesh, I think we tend to think about like the architecture part of it. I, Bob, I'm glad you pointed out the like distributed teams and like the people aspect of this. Um, I think my constant question for the, the, uh, the concept of a data mesh is why can't you enable the distributed nature of what you're talking about with a unified architecture? Um, I, I think that, that that's like the right way to do that. Yeah, so multiple logical systems on a single physical system. I feel like I advocate for that every week in some domain or another <laughs> inside Fivetran. Um, so one of the things I talked about at my keynote yesterday was how the modern data stack keeps swallowing up more and more use cases. Uh, it killed cubes a while ago. Uh, it's mostly killed Hadoop at this point. Uh, it, it keeps pulling more use cases into its orbit uh, it, it, because it's fundamentally so flexible and so capable of doing many different things well enough that you don't really want to buy another system, build another system for that one use case. And I'd love to hear from everyone on the panel, um, what do you think are some of the most interesting, surprising, significant uh, use cases that may start to get pulled into the orbit of the modern data stack in the next couple of years? Anybody who... Uh... I'll start. Complex data. I'm, I'm, I think that the future, I mean, what's happened if you sort of look historically, and again, I, I have the, the benefit of being able to go back into the 1970s in the, in the history of databases. And, and what's happened historically is, is, is people have found better and better ways to work with the data that matters. And originally it was all business data stored in some form of database. I mean, originally it was ISAM and network databases and relational and SQL in the 1980s replaced all of that in the structured space. You know, then we had the world where when semi-structured data came into existence uh, in the early 2000s with the advent of various forms of web and cloud, um, we, we didn't have solutions for that. And that's where Hadoop came up and MapReduce and it was very awkward. And, and now modern uh, cloud data warehouses have replaced that, have replaced that architecture largely. And as, as, as George says, they've largely also replaced all the OLAP architectures as well. Um, you know, we now have all this very, very interesting stuff that's happening in, in predictive analytics. And, and to me, the, the, the thing that's, that we've gone from semi-structured data as being the most interesting data sources to now having a wide variety of data sources. I was talking to a company involved in, in medical, medical, the medical field yesterday, and just the rich amount of data that exists in the images and the doctor's notes, and, and, and all of that is opaque to our systems today. It will not be in five years. It will not be. You know, even two to three years, that will all become part of the modern data stack and they'll be able to extract all of that useful information. And to me, that's a gigantic transformation into the types of applications that will be created in the years to come. I, my last job was at, I ran marketing for a company and I, as a marketing person was uh, very, like operational focused. I really like went deep into uh, kind of growth marketing and all of that stuff. And, and all of like the problem that you run into there is that um, you're constantly writing code to push data back and forth between systems because the different operational systems do, do different things and you need the same data in all of them. And we now have all of the data from all of those systems in the data warehouse. And then we have a way of like expressing arbitrary business logic inside the, the data warehouse, but no one has yet re-architected the systems now census, which is a company that I'm a big fan of and we're users and all of that. Um, they're enabling people to, in the modern data stack, just take all of the work that you've inter ingested in Fivetran, you've modeled in DBT, and now push it back out to your operating systems, or your operational systems. But I think we're like such at the beginning of that, that like no one actually knows how to like re-architect their marketing operations or their sales operations or any of this stuff yet. So I think there's like a lot that's gonna play out there. I mean, what you're really talking about, Tristan, is the advent of the data app, the modern data app, which uses, which, com which basically is, is an operational, it, it, it's an operational application that leverages data 
to actually make decisions for the business. I mean, that's the key thing about a data app is, is that it autonomously can make decisions for the business. And we've seen very few of those. I mean, they're very trivial examples. There's many trivial examples, but, but significant examples are mostly in the future, but boy, will they be significant in the future. Some of them are scary. There's, there's really two visions of the data app that I've seen. One of them is uh, the, the data app is a separate system and you take the important data from your data warehouse and you push it. And that's kind of the, the census uh, vision. And then the other vision is the data app is just natively built to run on top of the data warehouse. So it's designed and, and probably my favorite example of that is, is a startup called Narrator uh, that works like this. It was designed from the beginning to sit on top of your data warehouse. And I, I, I'm curious whether people have opinions or favorite examples about those two models and, and where they see that going. It's really the same conversation we've been having, George, about how these things are built, right? Because the data app is the, is the evolution of the predictive. It's predictive analytics that actually takes autonomous action. I mean, that's what a data app does. It's, it takes the data that would otherwise be presented to a person and instead leverages that to actually take actions within the business. And so what we're seeing is a very broad way, set of ways that they're being built. They're being built every which way today because there are very no, few good tools to build data apps. Uh, that will not be true in a few years, but, but the tool sets right now are relatively nascent in this space. We'll see all of this improve in every one of the major platforms I predict over the next couple of years. And they may take slightly different approaches, but the results should be similar. Uh, for me, I'm not really sure uh, what we're, what's going to be the, the best thing, but my preference is always to have ultimately at the end of the day, one data set that is very clean and well understood that we do not have to move anywhere. And so it would be, uh, I'm, not, I'm not familiar with that technology, but you know, anything that would allow us to have like singleton data retrieval um, that, that is performant uh, alongside like our large batch analytical processing, which is also working with our data science, you know, uh, that's that's the that's the nirvana. That's the goal is to just have one data storage and then having something that sits over top of it. And and each of those different things are are specialized for each of the different use cases. But you have one data store. Uh, I think we're I think we're a, a ways away from that. But that would be where I'd like to see us head. One of the things uh, that uh, you run into when you try to build data applications and, and take action automatically is that latency becomes incredibly important. And, and everybody in the ecosystem is, is battling this right now. I think this is actually one of the hardest things about data lakes. It's really hard to envision a data lake with low latency. Um, and uh, I, I think there's a lot of different visions of, of how we're gonna, we're gonna crush the latency problem and, and how low we need, need it to get. Um, and I, I'm curious to hear, you know, what others have seen around this and um, how, how low does the latency need to be? At what point, at what point do, do we have most of the interesting use cases that you're ever gonna do with your data warehouse? Um, and, and, and who's doing interesting work to, to get there? Well, you, know, the, the, you have an operational system, right? Everybody has operational systems and people have dozens to hundreds or even thousands of operational system. More and more, they're SaaS applications. They're outside of your organization. And, and they're always a source of truth now. They are pre the present. And a data warehouse or a data lake is about historical or the past. And Fivetran is really the data pipeline or one of many data pipelines, but probably the best data pipeline to get the data from, from now to the, to the past and to the historical system. And the question is, 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 is how, what does that latency need to be? Does it need to be zero seconds? I don't think so. I mean, there are applications where zero seconds is, or instant is required, mostly having to do with eventing of some kind and alerting of some sort. Most of the time, if you can get it in a minute or two, a separate system, that's enough time, that's not so far in the past that uh, uh, you, can, you can leverage that data inside your historical system with predictive analytics to begin to perform actions on it. And I, I think that this will be limited by and large. Well, right now there's limitations on, in many places, but ultimately I think that the historical data warehouse becomes the limitation in terms of how fast data can be ingested. And as you know, George, I encourage you to lower that latency of five mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in many of our conversations. <laughs> 
I think, George, George, I think, I mean, and again, this is a very complicated topic that I think is very use case specific, but there tends to be serious trade-offs that systems designers make between latency and throughput. And that's always been the case. And just a, a, a very simple example, if you want higher throughput, you batch. And the reason that you batch is that you don't have as many domain crossings. And then, you know, for whatever system you're working with, that could mean, you know, on a same CPU, like you don't lose cache locality between computers, like whatever, like you've got to hit the network and do a DMA or whatever it is. However, if you look at most systems, like you can make the trade-off, meaning you know you could do low latency in a data lake and you could do high throughput in a data warehouse or vice versa. Like these are not architectural limitations. If you really look down to it normally, they just tend to be the trade-offs that were made as a result of serving whatever like the primary use case is. And I think that's absolutely the case here. And so, you know, we've heard, I mean, I, I've heard a number of these kind of latency um, you know, throughput trade-off discussions in terms of this, and you actually get down to like a like a like a like a machine level. They are just a result of the trade-offs that are made on the system going into it. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yep, absolutely. Uh, I I think one of the interesting things that we see is that well, that's absolutely true. There is that trade-off. The the point at which batch, the the point at which you start to have to spend a lot more to get the latency lower is actually lower than people think. Uh, and uh, like I, I, I suspect you can get down into the 10 second range with still the sort of throughput optimized architecture. Basically the, the throughput optimized architecture, I suspect will go lower than we expect in terms When of do we get five ten to, to 10 seconds, George? Uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the problem is it's complicated. <laughs> what do you imagine will happen like with the serving layer, right? So you're your, your website still needs to operate over that data. Are you imagining that there's just going to continue to be a, a caching layer or is that going to be a separate system? It, it, it just depends. I mean, it some, depends on the, what the characteristics of the system need to be. If something needs to be really low latency, today's data warehouses are not, are not always the right solution for it. For it. And so, so it just depends on the application. Um, latencies will go down, you know, in these products, but but some of the fundamental architect to, to, to Martine's point, some of the architectural choices make the latency characteristics of a Snowflake somewhat different than, for example, the latency characteristics of a MEM SQL. Yeah. Just, I think I, these are little trade-offs. So, sorry, go ahead, Tristan. Oh, one of the things that I, I, for whatever reason, I don't see a lot of today, but uh, would like to see more of in the future is uh, Lambda architectures, but with off-the-shelf tools. So like my data flowing, you know, five trend copies at one time, but then flows it into a more streaming like system and a more batch like system so that I can get the best of both worlds. And five trend gives me consistency guarantees that like both data is always in the same place at, or in both places at the same time. Um, I, I, you know, I agree Like you're making trade-offs when you build these systems. I just like, as a user, I want to be able to choose and like have both of them. All right, well, we have one minute left. I'd like to ask a yes or no question for everyone. And the question <laughs> is, uh, will there be, will there emerge another major data platform alongside Snowflake, Databricks, Google, AWS, and Azure? We'll start with you, Michelle. Yes or no? Yes. Bob? What's your time scale? Time yes, scale. I was gonna say, what's your time scale? Oh yeah, yeah. In, the, in the next, sorry, in the next, uh, in the next five years. Yes. Yes. But but these guys are be massive. You know the new one. The, it's not clear the new one. The new one may be relatively small relative to those guys. Well, I said major. I said major. That sounds. It sounds like a. In Look, it, Snowflake was small five years ago. Justin, I think no. Martine, yes. All right. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining. This has been a really fun conversation. Really appreciate all of you being here. I know our audience does as well. Um, and I'll be seeing you all around. Thanks so much, George and panel. Yeah, we had amazing interaction. If you have a chance and interest to go into the chat um, and check it out, I think this was definitely our most conversational uh, conversational panel, but also conversation happening and questions being asked. So thank you so much. From here, we are gonna have a quick little break. So uh, next up we have Guli Zhu from Peloton who's gonna talk about organizational design. So be sure to close out of this one and then join us in just a few minutes on the next uh, Pathful event. And we'll see you then.